Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 164, which reads as follows. Yo sasanang arahatang aryanang dhamma jivinang patiko sati dhummedho titthing nisaya papikang palani katha kaseva atagataya bhanti which means Yo patikosati, yo dumedho patikosati, whatever fool, whatever person, whatever person insults, insults the religion of the of the enlightened ones, of the 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 noble religion, noble teaching. The Dhamma Jivi Jivina the Jivina uh, the the religion of those who live the holy life live according to righteousness the Aryas whoever insults it the fool Dumeda. Titing Nisaya Titing Nisaya Papikang Because of the uh, Because of the evil views Dependent on their evil views So they have evil views so they insult The noble Way Just like the Fruit of the Kattaka reed Palani Kattaka Seva they, the, they bear fruit The bearing of fruit Or the fruit that comes from their acts Destroys themselves So there's this reed The kattaka reed That is so When it bears fruit The fruit is so heavy that the reed snaps Such a person who insults the Reviles The good way the noble way and has evil views destroys themselves just like that the fruit of their evil so this was um, taught in regards to the elder Kala Kala was a monk who lived in Savati and it, the story goes that there was a certain woman who, maybe an elderly woman, who looked after him uh, with the tenderness of a mother for a son. So she took great care of him. Uh, and one day, her neighbors went to hear the Buddha this, uh, teach the Dhamma, and they said, Oh, it's how wonderful is it to hear the teachings of the Buddha? How great is it? And so hearing this, she says to the elders, she said, what do you think? Should I go and listen to the Buddha teach someday? And they said, no, 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 you shouldn't. And again, she started thinking about this, and so she asked him again, you know, well, why not? And he said, oh, no, no, it's not, not worth your time. Wouldn't give her a good reason, but he kept dissuading her from it. And the, the, we're told that it's the reason, his reasoning was, that if she went to hear the Buddha teach, she would have no use for him. Right? Here he was providing her with her only source of the Dhamma. Well, she went to see the Buddha, he knew it. He saw what happened then. They all, When they heard the Buddha teach, they, they got great, great faith from the Buddha. And then out of, in comparison, they would look at the, the other monks and say, these other monks, they would only have eyes for the Buddha. This happened a lot in, in my monastery. It's kind of funny um, because our headmaster is just so um, esteemed that most of the other monks actually starved or, or got or, or were very poorly taken care of. It was very hard to survive. 
some, in some ways as a monk in my monastery because everybody it was a very rich monastery but all the money and, and, and support went only to the top so uh, for those monks looking for for um, for gain it was very hard to to be well off as a monk there Whereas, I mean, that, that might sound strange because, of course, monks are supposed to be very content with little or nothing. But uh, in, in some places in, in Thailand, monks are able to be very well taken care of. So this monk um, was quite well taken care of and didn't want to lose this. There's also a reason why sometimes monks would leave a monastery and go off and start their own. is because when you're alone, well, you're the only monk and... The only religious teacher, it's very easy to get along. I mean, this is all, certainly I don't want to give you the idea that I'm condoning this or, or encouraging it. There's great danger and, and it's very wrong to be even thinking in this sort of way. This monk was, was very much in the wrong for his thought. And much more for his actions in dissuading this woman. So finally she'd had enough and she had her daughter um, yeah, she had her daughter bring food to the monk and take care of say, okay, take care of this monk do, do whatever you can to make sure he's happy I'm going to go to Jetavana and hear the Buddha teach and so the elder was in this I guess he was staying in a monastery in the city there would be I guess places to stay in the city and when this monk saw him coming when this monk saw her coming uh, bringing him food he asked her oh where, where's the where's your mother she said oh he's she's gone to hear the Buddhist Buddha teach and as soon as the elder heard the, the monk heard this he got consumed with anger and fear that she had disregarded his words, disregarded his evil advice and he ran or went quite quickly to Jetavana and when he saw this woman listening to the, Dhamma, the, the Buddha teach the Dhamma this anger and just blind rage because can you imagine having the audacity to do to, to, to do what he did which is he, he goes to the Buddha and says to the Buddha Bhante this stupid woman does not understand your subtle discourse on the Dhamma. How awful, no? To in the in front of the in front of this woman, scold her like that, and discourage the Buddha from teaching, as though the Buddha didn't know how to teach people to their own level, right? And he says, "Teach her instead." He, he has the audacity to tell the Buddha what to teach her. Teach her the duty of almsgiving and moral precepts, dana and sila. Basically what he's saying is, don't teach her anything deep. Why? Because I can't teach her anything deep, because I'm an evil, vicious, foolish monk, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm basically useless. So um, if you teach her the great dhamma, what use will she have for me? I mean, he doesn't say this, but this is, of course, the unspoken reason. It's because he's really a, a terrible person, and he doesn't want the comparison. So, if the Buddha just teaches teaches her simple things, things that won't actually make her enlightened, you know, of course, the worst for him would be if she were to become enlightened, because then she'd turn around and look at him and say, "Why are you teaching me, you useless man?" Uh, but if he teaches, if the Buddha were only to teach her uh, give charity and morality, well, then he'd have a chance. Because those are simple things that simple people can teach. It's not easy to teach about vipassana or insight meditation. It's not easy to teach people mindfulness. You know, it's easy to say the word mindfulness, be mindful, but to actually understand it and you know all these things, these things that we talk about, the paradigm shift and the way of looking at the world. Uh, in terms of ultimate reality 
seeing experiential reality and understanding is it it's not just intelligence it takes vision it takes insight it takes um it takes concentration or focus which means your mind has to be to some extent pure if your mind is full of evil unwholesome desires it's very difficult to think even to 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 resonate with concepts like impermanence suffering non-self not easy so he he compounds his evil by not only dissuading this woman from hearing the Buddha but now reviling her in front of the Buddha and ordering the Buddha instructing the Buddha on how to teach very evil so the Buddha looks at him and says Moga Purisa I'm assuming is the word he uses let's see Oh, he says, Dupanyo, you stupid person. Panya is wisdom. Dupanya means someone who has no wisdom. Papikang diting nisaya buddha nang sasa nang patiko sati. It's curious that the Buddha uses these words. He says, based on your evil views, you revile the religion of the, you revile the religion of the Buddhas. Because he's not actually. I mean, that's one thing he's not explicitly doing. And so this this speech is meant to connect it to the verse. And if you look at this, you might think, well, this is just the commentator trying to fit a different story in with this verse, which is totally unrelated. You might think that way, because right, the verse is about reviling the Dhamma, which is an important concept that we'll talk about. But the story is about uh, evil and, and the fear of losing one's gain, really. Uh, losing one's income, the fear of the Dhamma. But we can be charitable and uh, to the commentator, and there's an there's a easy way to understand this. I mean, that, that the Buddha is trying to, and in many cases it appears that this is the, the way it was, the Buddha was trying to redirect things. You know, often the Buddha's response to a problem is not to address it head on, because just can just uh, arguing with someone or, or debating or fighting with someone uh, may, may, may mean that in the end you're right and they're wrong but it may not fix the problem right what is the true problem here and so the Buddha hits the heart of the matter by saying in doing this you are you are uh, insulting the Dhamma you are reviling it you are in some way um, attacking the Dhamma. So rather than actually um, point out that he's just afraid of losing his gain, he says, uh, really what's at stake, what's, uh, what's at work here, in play, at work here, is your, your evil outlook, you know, your corrupt way of looking at things. Uh, and you're only going to hurt yourself. You, know, you think you're, you think this is to your gain to prevent this woman from hearing the Dhamma, but it's only to your loss. So he that he that attacks the Dhamma, right? because that's what's going on is this woman is hearing the Dhamma. This is the transmission of the Dhamma, the spreading, the arising, the growth, the planting of the seed of the Dhamma, right? This is what's happening, and he's he's attacking it like a soldier attacking a fortress. He's attacking the spreading of the Dhamma, the Dhamma Desana, the teaching of the Dhamma. So you can say that he's attacking, that he's still hard to see how he's insulting the Dhamma, but you can think of it as an insult to... Um, well, first off, suggest that the Buddha doesn't know how to teach. Second off, to um, to focus or to insist on the teachings only of morality and and, and charity, which, though useful and and quite Buddhist, are by no means deep or profound or conducive or in leading them in and of themselves to enlightenment. 
and then the Buddha teaches this verse. So that's the story. So what lessons we can gain? Again, I think we can look at the two different sides of this, the story side and the verse side. And in, in, in reference to the story, it's more related to um, evil views and how people use, make use of, of Buddhism, right? This monk is clearly not only greedy, but allowing his greed, and maybe that's the wrong word, but let's use it for now, allowing his greed to inform his actions. So why I say allowing is probably the wrong word is because uh, it's, it's more like based on his desire, right? And this is the key point. This is an important point to talk about. It's, it's common to think, I mean, it's or, an ordinary understanding of desire is uh, that it exists independent of our other emotions. You want something, um, and that's it. You want it, and either you get it or you don't get it. We don't connect that. We don't connect that the wanting, that our desires are very much related to our um, aversion and our fear and our um, jealousy, arrogance, conceit. That our desires um, corrupt our minds. Right? We have this idea that I can want things and still be a kind and nice and gen generous person to others, that it doesn't actually diminish my purity of mind. Right? We don't connect, we don't make a connection, generally speaking. You know, the fact that I want things, the fact that I like certain things, what does that have to do with whether I'm an evil or a good person? Right? What does that have to do with how I treat others? And this is a, an important example, it's, or it's a good example, of this important concept that there is a connection that as with all things this is the reason for the Buddha to take up the concept of karma and, and apply the word karma in a Buddhist sense to show that there, is, there are consequences and consequences that we didn't realize there are connections, causal connections between things like desire and cruelty how awful this man is to this woman. Can you imagine, you know, knowing what we know about how great Buddhist, the Buddha's teaching is, what a horrible thing to do, to, to prevent, to do whatever you can to prevent someone from hearing it, right? And how blind you have to be, but it's easy to see, right? This man's focus was so strongly on, on, on the things that he liked, right? He had cultivated such an addiction that it blinded him, that he probably didn't even think about whether it was good or evil. His mind was so clouded. This is what you see, you know. It's one thing to want something and to have, and, and then to, to know that you're feeling and that you don't want to share it with someone else. That you don't want to, to lose it to, to, for someone else's gain is when I, basically, right, to put it in general terms. If you gain, if this woman gains something, then he's going to lose something. So to, to an ordinary, ordinarily we weigh these things, right? We think, oh, if this woman goes to the Buddha, I'm going to lose my, my support, right? But of course, an ordinary human being with, with even an ounce of, or a shred of decency would feel ashamed and and acknowledge that it's much more important that this woman goes to see to talk to the Buddha. But you see this. This is it, it gets to the point where it blinds you. I, mean, I think you have to say that it's on another level, and this is why the Buddha brings up the idea of views, because your views blind you. This person's view, and and it's an in, it's an odd word, but if we think of it more as inability to see his blindness. He is blinded, right? He can't see. It's his, his view is this. This is his view. And by being and in being blind, or because of his blindness, 
he, uh, he does whatever he can to stop this woman from benefiting. But the point for us, I mean, this is a, a good, um, it's a good uh, lesson for us to think of this man, but a much better lesson is to ponder and consider that the, the um, immediate relationship between things like desire and uh, our you know, lack of compassion, uh, uh, stinginess, jealousy, avarice, envy, these kind of things, and cruelty. That um, you can't just go ahead and want and want and want and, and still be a kind and gentle person. I mean, you, it actually, the way it is, is more you want, it starts to suck away, it starts to eat away at your goodness. You can be a good person and start to want and to like things, but your wants and your needs... The reason why we don't see this is because ordinary life is full of evil. You know, ordinary human life, we don't think of it this way. And it only really makes sense if you actually take the time to meditate and become sensitive because that's what it is if you're living in a cesspool you aren't sensitive to to dirt to filth but once you begin to purif to to purify your mind like a person who's left the cesspool taken a shower and when they go anywhere near the cesspool they're completely revolted you become more sensitive to it, and I mean, good people are more. This is what we talked about last time. Good people are quite sensitive to evil. Evil people are not sensitive to evil. They're quite sensitive to good, and uh, allergic to it, one might say. And this is a really important point with craving. Craving isn't so. Desire isn't so much about the consequences. Um, you know, in terms of. Uh, you know, later you might not get what you want, you'll be upset. That's important, but much more important is the very n act, the very nature of the act or the state of wanting something, and that it, it corrupts the mind. It has an immediate effect, and it has a direct relationship with your clarity, your purity, your goodness of, of heart. That's a part of what you see in meditation. You can see the right. you can see and feel directly how wrong it is to cling to things, to desire things, which seems so foreign to most people, right? There's this idea that it's part of being human. And it's more static, right? We think of it as static. I like X as though you've always liked X and you always will like X and it's just part of who you are. Which is not at all the case. It's a habit. And by reinforcing it you're you're strengthening it. And it's pulling on everything else. It's taking energy away from good things you can be doing. And it's corrupting them. It's lowering, it's reducing your interest in being a good person. So, this is um, the sorts of things that uh, are interesting in regards to the story. The verse, again, related though it is, does clearly teach a different... Uh, a different lesson, um, but related, and it's related to uh, the idea of karma. And it offers an interesting um, the interesting idea that there's something especially bad about evil done in relation to Buddhism, right? I mean that—that's how it. That's the superficial the superficial description. But what it's really saying is that when you oppose good things, your your opposition to good things is um, 
resulting results in evil proportionate to the goodness of the thing that you're opposing. That's really the Buddhist um, dogma or doctrine. Right? In Buddhism, what's the most pure and beautiful and wonderful and, and good thing? Of course, it's the teaching of the Buddha, not just in its theoretical state, but in terms of the dissemination. Anyone who gets in the way of someone hearing the Buddha's teaching, I mean, is understandably thought to be doing one of the most horrific things possible. Not, not the most, but it's got to be up there. To cut someone off, to purposefully prevent someone from such a powerful good. It's a special sort of evil, right? It takes for this man to allow his desires to lead him to actually ignore this woman's good or prevent her, you know, to be so blind. It takes blindness, is the point. Beyond ordinary blindness, it takes a, a mindset is really what diti, you know, diti was the word view and that's what it means. But it, it relates to mindset. This person just is perverse really. Their mind is corrupt or perverse, twisted is the point. The way they look at the world is so mi mixed up, messed up. That's really what view is all about. And so that's what this is teaching. It's teaching about views. Well, it's, yeah, so it's more than one thing. It's teaching about the special evil of reviling the Buddha, of reviling the Dhamma, or the Sangha, of attacking them. Uh, and it's talking about the, the evil that's required to do that, the, the evil of views, how twisted you have to be. And so that's how this all relates to meditation and, and how views come into play and what, what views really mean in Buddhism and why they're such an important thing. A view, the views that we're concerned about, the concept of views, is the twisted way of looking at the world. Right? We had this question about what is right view. Well, theoretically, right view is anything that's in line with, with reality. Um, but that's not really what we're concerned about. We're concerned with is uh, obtaining noble view, which really means a straight relationship with reality, where you see things, you connect with reality. This is this; it is what it is. Right? I mean, it sounds simple. That is right view. So hard. Right? We think, well, you know, there must be something more to it than that. The problem is, there's so much more to it than that, and all that more to it is what's wrong. And we make so much much out of everything and twist things. And that's really good. two different things. You can make more of something than it is, like this is good, this is bad. And that's already twisted, never mind. But as soon as you see something as good or bad, it's, it's twisted. No, you can make something more out of something like, say, this is a hand. It's not actually a hand. It's light touching your eye. And I mean, even that is making a little more out of it. It's seeing. Right? This is seeing, but you think it's a hand. That's making more out of it than it actually is. That's not really a problem. That's a, it's potentially leading to problems. But the, the real problem is when you get twisted and you say, Oh, what a beautiful hand. What an ugly hand. What a stupid thing for him to do to raise his hand. Or, Oh, what a, I really like that he's doing that. Maybe you think it's funny or maybe you think it's clever. And you start to twist it. Maybe you think you're clever because you understand it. Maybe you think you're more clever because you could have thought of a better way to explain it, right? So much twisting and turning. Maybe we can make another, we can tie this into the idea of the reed. It's like you have this reed and if the reed is straight, it can bear all that fruit. But when it's twisted, it snaps. The twisting of the mind what the twisting of the mind really does is it makes you twisted. You can't see your body. It's like you become mentally a hunchback, is what I'm trying to say. It's like you look at someone whose body is, whose back is not straight. 
This is the way the mind goes. The mind becomes, it coils in on itself. It recoils. Evil is like that. Weighs heavily on the mind is what the Buddha says. It weighs so heavily on the mind that it breaks the mind. That's a good example. This man was clearly so consumed by evil that he did the unthinkable. I mean, there are worse things he could have done, like he could have come and tried to kill the Buddha or something. Oh no, if I kill the, maybe if I kill the Buddha, she won't be able to hear his teachings. That would have been worse. But it's still, it's, it's hard to fathom the gall of this man. And clearly caused by evil. This isn't just a fan this isn't just a fairy tale. This is happening all the time. Today there was a, sh uh, a mass shooting in Las Vegas, and uh, I think it had something to do with that. Apparently, I don't really follow the news, but uh, something to do with a gambling debt, which is very apropos to this sort of story. Can you imagine? Incredible, incredible to think. If assuming that this is what I heard or what I read was was what really happened, someone was became so consumed by greed and and anger at their loss that they went out and shot hundreds of people or something. This isn't a fairy tale. This is reality. There are very real consequences to our evil. And you think, wow, you're overstating it, you know. My evil is not like that man's evil. It's only a matter of degree. Evil is evil. And that's why we call it evil. We don't beat around the bush and say, it's okay. Everyone likes things that's not really evil. It is. It really is evil. It's evil to want anything. It's just a matter of degree. This is what we don't get. We think it's okay to like, just don't get out of hand. It's all out of hand. It's all wrong. There's no good that comes from wanting or liking things. It's a hard pill to swallow. But for someone who's mindful, there's no other way. You can't, you can't see things that way anymore. That wanting could be in any way good. You can't deny the fact you don't want to deny the fact. You free yourself from the blindness of thinking that there's some good to be had from liking or wanting. So, that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in.